So I'd like to uh, welcome everybody to this uh, second day of uh, Sergei Guryev's lectures on political economy of populism, jointly organized by the CEPR and Bank of Finland. So on behalf of Bank of Finland Institute for Emerging Economies, I would like to welcome everybody. Please, Sergei, the floor is yours. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Ika, for organizing and for uh, chairing this uh, uh, event. Uh, indeed, I will continue right where I left it last time. I remind you that we talked about the measurement and definition of the recent uh, uh, rise of populism, definition of populism and measurement of its recent uh, rise. And then we started to talk about drivers of the recent rise. And we talked about economic factors uh, such as long-term trends in uh, robotization and um, uh, globalization, in particular China in Perchak. Now, I also mentioned that we have other drivers such as one-off shocks, uh, such as Great Recession and subsequent austerity. So Great Recession in 2008-2009 was a very unusual event. It was a acute global economic shock, which actually originated from within advanced economies. So this is the first uh, major financial crisis in a lifetime, or at least in a generation, uh, when it was a problem not in Latin America, not in Asia, not in Russia, but in, uh, in uh, advanced economies, in particular in the US. And that, of course, undermined the trust in the elites, which created an opportunity for, uh, for uh, the populists, who are, by definition, anti-elite politicians. So let me uh, also say that unlike globalization and robotization, this crisis was quite short, especially in the US, less so in Europe. And that, of course, allows for identifying the impact. So you can actually measure before and after the crisis. And of course, what also mattered was the different magnitude of the shock. In different places, economies were structured in a different way. Uh, different economies were vulnerable to a different extent. And so in that sense, it would be easier to study these events than those long-term trends that I mentioned. Now, uh, the first paper that uh, I think is worth mentioning in this um, uh, sense is a paper by short paper by Stevenson and Wolfers, which was published in AR Papers and Proceedings, which simply provided the first takeaway of the impact of Great Recession on trust and in institutions. 2011, you don't have any Donald Trump or Brexit. Even Marine Le Pen is still not as successful. Um, However, Stevenson and Wolfers already look at the change in trust. And they look at local data. They actually, in some regressions, control for state-specific business cycle. They look at unemployment rate, and they show that the higher the change in unemployment rate, the less trust there is in Congress, banks, big, big business, less so in Supreme Court. So this is very interesting that they already identify the placebo, right? So why would you worry about the quality of US court system if you just had a major financial crisis? No, you're apportioning the blame to Congress, to banks, to big business. Some, some data sources also show the decline in, in trust in newspapers. Other data sources don't. So here they show the Gallup data and they show the general social uh, survey, GSS, confidence in institutions. And now they, you see they look through a long period of time. So they show that uh, Great Recession is not just an outlier. It's a part of a one big trend. Of course, the increase in unemployment in 2008, 9, 10 was the biggest, as I said, in a lifetime, uh, or at least in a generation. So most of these uh, results are actually driven by the uh, global financial crisis. But overall, it is important that we already see the impact of rising unemployment on, on um, uh, trust uh, towards the elites. And not just any elite, as I mentioned, what matters is, uh, what matters is uh, specific kinds of elites, which are quite likely being 
and were culprits in 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 the global financial crisis. Now, uh, Europe, of course, provides a much better uh, much better laboratory to test that because in Europe the heterogeneity was much bigger and. Uh, if uh, you think about European crisis, the change in unemployment was substantial. Even on average, there was a major increase in unemployment. Uh, here I show you the average European unemployment that changed from 7% before the crisis to 11% in 2013. But what is even more important is the heterogeneity. So here, for example, I show you the change in unemployment in the south of Europe, Eastern Europe, Central Europe, and Northern Europe. And you see that, say, in Northern Europe, change was a couple of percentage points, and then it came down. In uh, the core Europe, that was not really an increase in unemployment. Uh, in East Europe, increase was, again, a couple of percentage points, and then it came down. Eastern Europe is the place where you don't have unemployment because uh, everybody is leaving those places. But then in Southern Europe, you had a 10 percentage point increase in unemployment. And here we show the distribution by NATS2 regions, the uh, subnational regions, and you see the whole distribution moved from single digit unemployment to the right. And again, even before the crisis, you would have regions with unemployment above 10 percent and above 20 percent. But again, the whole distribution moved to the right quite a lot, and now you have uh, regions with unemployment of more than uh, more than um, thirty percent. Now, this is the paper which we wrote together with Elias and uh, Jan Algan and Evgenia Passari. This is the paper I mentioned before. It's published in uh, Brookings Papers in Economic Activity, 2017. Here we look at uh, 26 European countries, 200 plus subnational regions uh, in 20 years. Well, 17 years, 18 years. And we show that if you just run a regression uh, on those regions and look at vote outcomes uh, and run this panel with fixed effects for the regions, you have the correlation between unemployment and uh, populist vote one for one. So if your regional unemployment goes up by say 10 percentage points, populist vote goes up by 10 percentage points. And we did it in different ways. We just ran a panel regression. We also ran a uh, before and after regression where we compared the change in unemployment before and after the crisis and change in, change in uh, uh, populist vote. Now, when we are asked about the mechanism, we quite naturally looked at uh, confidence in uh, politicians. Uh, we looked at uh, European Social Survey, which is run every two years. And so we looked at the trust in European political institutions, national political institutions, and we saw substantial decline in trust towards uh, European and national politicians. Now, no change in trust to global institutions such that UN, no change in trust in courts, police. This is very important. Again, you have a clear placebo. Police is not to be blamed by uh, in the crisis, and so it's not blamed. Uh, no change or very little change trust towards other people, and um, uh, that is uh, that is something that uh, we find reassuring. So people apportion the blame for the crisis on European and national political institutions. Another result, which is very very important, other people have run these regressions. There are at least two papers. One is by Guizon co-authors, and the other one by Dustman and co-authors. Uh, they look at individual unemployment. We also looked at individual unemployment and we show that the impact of regional unemployment is much larger than that of individual unemployment. So even if you don't lose a job, but you see that your region has higher unemployment, you are more likely to vote for populists. So people care about others or people understand that if you have more unemployed people around you, then your wage is unlikely to go up in your uh, perception of your own risk to lose a job is uh, higher. So people do care about regional unemployment, even if they themselves have a job. Okay. So, uh, uh, so what we what we do, we run a, a regression, as I said, uh, both in as fixed effects and and uh, and uh, before and after. And this is the chart which shows you the difference in unemployment rate from minus 10 percentage points to 
plus 10 percentage points normalized to zero. These are deemed changes. And uh, you see the difference in voting share of populace, and you see that there is a one for one relationship. The colors here reflect different parts of Europe, South, West, East, and so on. Um, the causality uh, issue is addressed by looking at pre-crisis structure of the regional e economy. So we, in addition to running this OLS panel regressions, we also look at pre-crisis structure of regional economy. And uh, we argue that some sectors were hit harder. And what are these sectors? Real estate and construction. And we show that if you had more real estate and construction in your regional economy before the crisis, you are more likely to be hit harder. And so we use this variation driven by pre-crisis structure of the economy. And we show that uh, then the causal effect is actually even higher. So it's a two percentage point increase per each percentage point increase of unemployment rate. So if you have five percentage point increase in unemployment, the causal impact on populist vote is 10 percentage point of the vote. So it's a huge effect. So in that sense, crisis has been a large, large driver in the rise of uh, populism. So in principle, that means that if you go back, back here and say, well, in Europe, you have the change from 7 to 11% in unemployment. That already gives you 8 percentage point increase in populist vote share. That is roughly half or more than half than the total increase of populist vote share in Europe. I should say that we also run a special regression for Brexit. Brexit is not part of our main data set. Why? Because Brexit is not actually a parliamentary election. You don't have a populist party running in this regression, in, in this election. So Brexit referendum is kind of a separate event, but we actually find the same result. When we take 380, um, uh, elect 379 electoral districts in Great Britain uh, and look at difference in unemployment rate, we also find a major increase in uh, vote share of Brexit in places which had higher increase in the unemployment rate. And unemployment in Great Britain, it's a completely different or order of magnitude than in, uh, in say Greece or Spain, but still some places have actually a de decline in unemployment. These are the places in London and some places had an increase in unemployment before, uh, before versus after the crisis. And these are, of course, are England. And uh, these are the places where support for Brexit was actually higher. And basically, if you had no change in unemployment, you would have no Brexit for sure. Okay. So uh, I should say that our study is not the only study of uh, Brexit. And I highly recommend uh, uh, Sasha Becker's and co authors uh, paper in the economic policy journal, which uh, uh, looks at all kinds of uh, potential explanations. And one of the things they find is you don't actually have uh, what people thought is very important. There is no correlation between exposure to immigration and uh, uh, exposure to immigration and trade and, uh, and Brexit. So now this is not uh, a paper which has uh, a sophisticated instrumental uh, uh, a variable strategy, but at least you don't have the correlation with immigration, which is kind of something that you would expect if you look at this picture. Of course, it is London, which has majority of immigrants, while rural England has no immigrants. And yet people vote in rural, uh, in rural England for Brexit, for the leave. And I'll talk about that later. Uh, it is important that, of course, we need to think about identification strategy here. Immigrants live where they're welcome. And these are usually the more prosperous, more diverse places which are less likely to vote for Brexit. And so what uh, Zasha Becker and co-authors show is that uh, what matters is income and employment and the extent of fiscal austerity post-crisis. They also look at uh, Marine Le Pen vote and they find similar results. Now, a very important paper about Brexit, talking about this, is one of co-authors of uh, Sasha Becker, Timo Fetzer, published a single author paper in AR two years ago uh, on uh, the impact of austerity uh, on Brexit. So the paper's title is Austerity Causes Caused Brexit. And uh, what uh, he talks about is the post 
crisis austerity reform, where UK government actually cut uh, welfare benefits. And of course, uh, welfare benefits hit harder the regions which relied on welfare benefits. So it was a hugely regressive fiscal policy. So people who already needed those welfare benefits were hit harder. And roughly speaking, London was not hit, hit as much uh, because, um, because people there were not unemployed. So what, what he does, he looks at uh, those 379 electoral districts. He also has a number of individual level surveys and the results that he finds are striking. He actually has a large impact of uh, benefit cuts. He builds a, a measure of benefit cuts uh, index, phi, and then he shows that whatever he controls for in those 379 districts, um, he uh, shows that um, uh, shows that there is a major impact on vote for UKIP and for leave. Now you don't see uh, significant stars in this um, in this table. Why? Because it's American Economic Review, which recently removed significant stars. But if you look at uh, coefficients and standard errors, you see that they're strongly significant. Before going, uh, before uh, taking your questions, let me just say that um, that. Uh, uh, there are a couple of papers on Sweden as well. A lot of people would say, well, how come you have a rise of populism in Sweden? Sweden does have generous social welfare state. And that probably means that in Sweden, the explanations are actually non-economic. This is misleading. And this is what a couple of papers by Dalbo Finan, Folke Persson and Rikne uh, talk about. They show that you don't need to look at the crisis. You actually need to look at welfare state reform in mid 2000s, which was called, uh, it was ca carried out by center right government. It was called make work pay. And uh, it worked well for some people, but actually worked really badly for whom uh, uh, Dalbo and co-authors called uh, outsiders and economic losers. And they show that uh, in this case, populists, people who ran on SD uh, ticket, Sweden Democrats ticket, were actually individually the economic losers. So it wasn't a local Donald Trump who ran on this ticket. These were actually people who were pushed out of labor market and didn't get the social welfare. And these were the guys who voted for SD and uh, also people themselves candidated themselves. So it's like a citizen's candidate um, reincarnated and observed in this particular election. And kind of similar results uh, are uh, found by Cyrus Dehdari, uh, who, uh, who just published his paper in political science journal. So austerity reforms did contribute to the rise of populism. And uh, in that sense, we shouldn't be surprised. And this is something that we document both in Europe and uh, and uh, in Sweden, oh, sorry, in, in the UK and in Sweden. And we talk about certain other things in the in the survey, but these are the main main papers. That's been 15 minutes. I don't see any questions on the chat. I don't know. Should I should we stop? Uh, uh, there are no questions, but perhaps I, I can pose a question since you, yes, please. you talk about the evidence from the UK and Sweden and more generally in uh, perhaps in Europe. Uh, are there similar studies looking at say non-European, non-North American ex experience? Uh, does something similar happen to representative democracies uh, elsewhere? So we don't know that and we don't look at uh, other places, but uh, could have been of course. And, uh, and we don't know, we don't know that. And, in our survey, we mostly focus on um, Western countries. Why? Because the recent rise of populism was uh, related to Western uh, countries. And uh, that's why our survey generally mostly focuses on Western countries. And the other thing, of course, is uh, economists like uh, good quality of data, high quality of data. And this is what you find in advanced economies rather than in uh, mid, uh, mid, middle income or, or uh, developing countries. So no, we don't, we don't have that. Finally, as I mentioned, populism is something that probably is 
more likely to emerge in in uh, democratic countries and uh, uh, representative democracies. Democracies outside of outside of uh, Europe are not too many. So, so we don't we don't have those studies. So I don't know those. Okay. So. Yeah, that's uh, it's, it's an interesting question. I mean, I was thinking of countries like Brazil or Philippines, yeah. where something at least related seems to be. Yeah, happening. that's yeah, yeah, that's true. So we don't have papers on Philippines, on Brazil. I I'll mention Brazil when I talk about internet, and I would just say that uh, in Brazil you can actually attribute the rise of. Um, Bolsonaro to, which is quite new, right? Bolsonaro is one of the first right-wing populists in Latin America. Uh, so the victory of Bolsonaro is driven by, uh, in, in what we've read, by the rise of, the rise of uh, corruption in the incumbent parties. So the big corruption scandal was so huge that it completely destroyed the two mainstream parties. And uh, several of their leaders either went to jail or were not allowed to run. And uh, then also the use of fake uh, narratives, which propagated especially widely online. So Bolsonaro's campaign was digital on WhatsApp. WhatsApp at that point was especially well suited for propagation of uh, news, which is very hard to fact check. And I'll, I, I don't have a graph, but uh, we have it in the paper uh, which we refer to. So this is a paper with Melnikov and Juravska, my paper with Melnikov and Juravska. We show that in places where you had more mobile broadband internet, Bolsonaro got more votes, which is per se is striking because these are the places which are more urban, more educated. And there are papers on Brazil, which show that Bolsonaro had uh, less vote on, um, from places uh, where you have more educated voters. There is a paper which actually shows that the rise of male unemployment helped Bolsonaro, while the rise of female unemployment didn't because even unemployed women didn't like Bolsonaro, who is of course a very much uh, populist. Okay, thanks. Uh, actually, we have a, a question on the, in, this relates to Germany and Sweden from Daniel Kalugov. In Germany and Sweden, there's a period of single political party being in charge for several decades. Well, I guess in Germany, two, two political parties. So does the party have a tendency of going closer to populism the longer it remains in charge? Okay. So uh, we, don't, we don't have studies like this, but as I mentioned, we have studies uh, which show that center-right parties move to the right when radical right parties uh, are becoming more popular. And we have descriptive studies like this, and we have a well-identified regression discontinuity uh, paper like this. So there is a paper which looks at Europe, and it shows that when radical right parties cross the threshold to get into parliament, the center right party moves to the right in its uh, rhetoric, ideology, and narrative. So this is something that we observe. Uh, what uh, Daniel is asking, I'm not aware of research like this, but uh, I think uh, the general speculation is in this direction. And as you rightly said, Vika, indeed, it's not just one party and two center parties. So, and what is happening is these parties which move to the center, center left and center right, and become so similar and occasionally actually sharing the grand coalition, building a grand coalition that it creates an opportunity to push the populist narrative saying all the centrist elites, they're detached from us normal people and they're the same. You need an alternative. And the alternative is uh, us, right wing to left wing populist. Okay, thanks. Well, perhaps we can now move, off, move yeah. forward. Yeah, yeah. Take, take yeah. more questions so, in 15 minutes. Yes, exactly. So, uh, so let, me, let me move forward. Uh, there was a question on the chat regarding regarding whether unemployment results in more left-wing populism. The results on left-wing populism in our paper are not as strong as right-wing populism. Uh, most beneficiaries from unemployment are actually right-wing populists, which is of course a puzzle we mentioned many times before. Why if you lose economically, you move to the right uh, populism rather than to left populism. 
and this is this is striking and this is something that I'll, I, I'll have I have something to say about now non-economic explanations so as I mentioned one very important hypothesis is silent revolution cultural backlash uh, where uh, uh, people who are left behind these are usually non-college and educated white men uh, which are hit by the crisis they start talking about how silent revolution the an onslaught of uh, progressive values protection of minorities uh, gender equality agenda uh, lgbt equality agenda um, makes people think that they're left behind and there is too much political correctness and so on and notice an ingle card show some regressions in their book i should say that these regressions are descriptive they're not well identified. Some people believe that Norris and Engelhardt say that economics doesn't matter, but actually in their regressions, you also see the role of unemployment, so you see a role of income. So uh, it's both cultural and non-cultural explanations that you can see in their book. Uh, but overall, it's descriptive. Now, overall, cultural explanations are problematic exactly because uh, uh, they are descriptive because culture doesn't change over time. Those cultural divides are um, slowly changing at best, and in most cases, they're persistent. And so it's very hard to argue that, that uh, uh, things uh, related to non-economic explanations are easy to identify. With all secular character of robotization and uh, uh, import, uh, uh, imports from China shock, these are quite rapid trends relative to cultural divides. Okay, Cultural divides change over times of whole lifetimes or, or generations at least. Now, there are also issues related to identity. So some people don't like immigration and uh, they start thinking about salient issues like identity, us versus them. There, is, there are issues related to security. There is a narrative that immigrants bring uh, crime and terrorism. There is also an issue of identity related to emigration, which is something that ICA, of course, is very well aware of. In Central and Eastern Europe, the issue is that all young people leave for London or Frankfurt. So Bulgarians worry that nobody will read uh, Bulgarian uh, poetry in, in a generation. And if you couple it with influx of refugees from other places, you say, look, we have more non-Bulgarians than Bulgarians in our place or more non-Hungarians than Hungarians. So we lose our culture and uh, uh, you may say that in Central and Eastern European countries, some people actually say we want more diversity, meaning that Europe should have Hungarians, Europe should have Bulgarians, and Hungary and, and uh, Bulgaria are disappearing. And uh, in that sense, that, that, that is also an issue. And again, all these uh, immigration studies, I can tell you right away, uh, we don't have well-identified uh, effects that we can document because probably we don't have enough, uh, enough observations. Um, uh, if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer. Now, the question is why now? Uh, these are slow moving, uh, slow moving uh, events. And one explanation is refugee crisis. Uh, the shock of 2015, I'll show, you, I'll show you the graph later on, but basically it was a huge shock. Uh, 2015 uh, resulted in a major major jump in the uh, number of uh, immigrants. Let me actually show you uh, the influx of asylum applications uh, in 2015-16 was really huge and not just Syrian. So below the, this line, this line shows you uh, asylum applications from Syria in the EU. And this is the total. Uh, and this is of course is driven by ISIS, um, uh, Islamic State. And you see a jump. It was a growth uh, from uh, 200,000 to three or 400,000. And then you have a jump to more than a million. So this was a huge jump, which su suddenly made immigration a salient issue. Some other people would say the challenge was uh, uh, the economic shock. And some people would say that left behind individuals suddenly uh, were more perceptive to the narrative, uh, which was against uh, immigrants, against uh, progressive agenda, and so on. However, we also survey a study, which I find fascinating, where populists managed to create identity agenda without economic shocks. 
So they conjure identity and agenda out of thin air. And this is a story of uh, Austrian Freedom Party, uh, Freiheit Party of Österreich, uh, which under Jörg Haider was actually not Islamophobic. Now in 2005, Jörg Haider is pushed aside and new leader, Christoph uh, Strache takes over. So Strache, you probably remember a couple of years ago, he was involved in a scandal where uh, investigative journalists uh, staged a provocation. One lady posed as a Russian oligarch's uh, niece and he promised her apparently being under influence of alcohol. He promised uh, her that he will give um, procurement contracts to a Russian oligarch, and then he had to step down. Government coalition actually fell apart. But before that, he was an extremely successful populist, and he brought his party into government coalition. So what he did in 2005, he said, we need a new agenda, which will be anti-Turkish, anti-Muslim agenda. And he referred to the Turkish-Austrian wars in 16th and 17th century and pillaging of Austrian villages by Ottomans. And so he reactivated this history. And uh, what Oxner and Rosel show, when you look at the villages were actually pillaged three or 400 years ago by Turks, uh, these are the villages where uh, uh, Strache's propaganda worked especially well. So here is, here is a different diff for you. So when uh, uh, you ask people uh, whether they are uh, pro or anti-Muslim in pillaged and non-pillaged villages before uh, the campaign by uh, Freedom Party of Austria, of Austria, there was no difference. Anti-Muslim sentiments increased after this uh, campaign a lot, but they increased by five percentage points in non pillage villages and by 20 percentage points, 18 percentage points in pillaged places. So it's a huge, huge gap. And then when you look at the vote for uh, Freedom uh, Party of Austria, you see that uh, there was no pre-trend uh, in all the decades before pillaged versus non pillaged. And then suddenly after this campaign starts in 2005, they suddenly start to get more and more vote. And essentially they get eventually up to one and a half percentage points. Interestingly, later on, uh, the center, center right party took away some of that agenda. Uh, and so yet uh, they continue marching on and what is striking is how much, how much they actually benefited from that. And in those elections, they were still at the level of single digit vote share. So one and a half percentage points was a lot. Okay. Now, how do we explain that? So as I mentioned, there is a, a whole set of papers going back to Moses Shayo's paper in 2009 in American Political Science Review and his survey of this literature in 2020 in the, America, in the Annual Review of Political Science. So these uh, studies were then applied to uh, the current events. And there is a paper by Grossman and Helpen that since came out in Review of Economic Studies. There is a paper by Besslin Person, which has a dynamic model. There is a paper by Genaoli and Tabellini. They all refer to social identity theory by uh, sociologists Stifel and Turner. And basically they build a model of social identity, which is endogenous. So people define themselves through a cognitive process of choosing who, which group to join. And before they would join a left-right definition of political uh, cleavage. So for them, the left-right dimension was most uh, salient. And so they would say, I identify with the working class. And now, since immigration becomes more salient, people start thinking about immigration much more than uh, about uh, have and have nots. They think about globalization much more than uh, being a, a worker or a capitalist. And then in Genaoli and Tabellini, I should say, what is even more important is that cognitive process changes and people start uh, looking for information which reinforces their beliefs. And they want to be closer to the average member of their groups. This is part of the social identity theory. So 
uh, you don't want to be a member of a losing group. But if you are, if you've chosen a group you want to be a part of, then within the group, you don't want to be far away from a representative member of your group. And so you will move closer to the member of your group, which may result in polarization, not of just political attitudes, but also factual beliefs. And there are a couple of papers by Alicina Miana and Stancheva who actually document that, uh, which we also refer to in, in, in our survey. It's a strike and to what extent the process today is not just polarization of politics, but also polarization of factual beliefs. So people live in different realities because of this process. So this is something that I, 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 I uh, find fascinating. So one question is why immigration is so silent? So people would say, let's take, uh, let's look at the data. Global data tell you that immigration is not on the rise. Basically we had 3% uh, of people living in a country different from where they were born today and 3% was the number 25 years ago. It's increasing a bit, but so increased greatly. However, if you look at the Western countries, there was a couple of decades of a huge increase. So in Europe, the number of uh, people who were born outside of Europe was 6% in 1990s, 11% today. So it's doubling. Overall in high income countries from eight to 13. Even in the US, which always was an immigrant country, the number has increased from 10 to 15%. And then of course, there was a very silent event, the refugee shock. So we shouldn't be surprised that when you look in the US, when you look at the um, most important problem facing the country, today, I guess it would be racism and COVID, but, but in, by 2018, the biggest problem was actually immigration. And this happened in the last 10 years. So we shouldn't be surprised that this is what we actually observe. And uh, uh, you, you also see inequality, racism and so on, but uh, what matters the most is immigration. And the triangle is raised. So I guess in 2020, these numbers would be slightly different. Uh, but uh, things like abortion, inequality, poverty, environment, outsourcing of jobs, they're all second order relative to immigration. So. That really matters. So these are the these are the these are the global and uh, high income country trends that I just mentioned. So globally, as you see, there is no change. There is three percent of uh, share of immigrants overall in the world, and these are the high income countries: uh, OECD, EU, North America. The numbers are actually quite big. So, and this is the chart I showed you already. So we shouldn't be surprised that you have those uh, things that I mentioned, uh, where you have, um, where you have the, um, the uh, increase in salience of immigration, and therefore self-categorization in terms of attitude to others, to globalization and to immigration. And I don't really have time to talk about those theories, but I should say that there are models of two-dimensional conflict and even three-dimensional conflict. And for example, in Genaoli and Tabellini, you have three axes, left, right, liberal, conservative, and pro-anti-globalization. And they show that since the, the, uh, the latter two axes are correlated, uh, the positions on them are likely to be correlated and so on. But they show how class-based based identity is crowded out by culture and globalization attitudes. So. Uh, they also show that uh, uh, if they look at the data, they, they have a special survey in France, when they look at the data just in 2013 and 2017, and look how people cluster with regard to left-right dimension and globalization dimension, this change happened uh, exactly in those few years. And this is a chart from Genaoli and Tabellini, where the, this is a descriptive chart. So there is no regression in here. This is kind of a cluster analysis, which shows that used to be the divide between left and right. And now it's a divide between closed versus open. So this is something that which is happening right now in, uh, in front of us. So before, before breaking, let me just show you a couple of slides on populism in France. So this is uh, a striking, uh, striking study. It's again, descriptive. And there is a book in French and working paper in English by Algan, Jan Algan, Elizabeth Bisley, 
uh, Daniel Cohen and Martial Foucault, they use this unique data set from Sevipov, which is a research center in Sciences Po, of which Martial Foucault is a director. So this data set is a huge data set of French on French voters which gives you a very detailed picture of what French voters think uh, over time, whom they vote for, what their, uh, their incomes are, what their attitudes are. And this book is extremely detailed. It just came out in French called po Origins of Populism, somewhat parallel to uh, Hannah Arendt's o o Origins of Totalitarianism. Uh, but uh, so this is a book which still has not come out in English, but there is a working paper which tell you a very clear story. So let me show you a couple of slides from this book. So what is uh, nice about France is also not just the, the uh, fact that we have very detailed data, but also the fact that you have in 2017 presidential election, extreme left candidate Mélenchon and extreme right candidate Le Pen. And uh, uh, both got about 20% as well as uh, center-right candidate Fillon and the center candidate Macron. So these four candidates each got about 20%, right? And Macron got, I think, 24 or something. And uh, uh, this tells you how uh, you have four equally sized groups. And so we can ask a question, what is different between those groups? And you see that extreme left and extreme right distrust elites, they distrust Politicians, they, just, uh, they believe that society is not fair. They distrust the government. While centrist voters trust the elites. Now, uh, when you look at the uh, openness, attitudes to uh, nationalism and EU, you see the picture that uh, Macron, Macron voters are most pro-European. Le Pen voters are most nationalistic and anti-European. But Milan voters are kind of okay. They're not anti EU. On the axis of open versus close, Milan Schoen voters are average. All these pictures are, are uh, standardized uh, to have mean of zero, uh, de mean measures. So you have a big difference between Milan Schoen voters and Le Pen voters. They both are populist, they distrust the elites, but uh, Milan Schoen voters are not nativist. Okay. And then this is. Uh, uh, this is uh, very striking. So uh, there, uh, uh, Algan and co-authors look at two dimensions of beliefs of those voters, life satisfaction and trust to other people. And this is where you have a huge difference. So the centrist candidates, Macron and Fillon get people who have higher quality of life. They're better educated and earning a lot. Milan voters are earning less, they're well-educated, but they're overall are not happy with their lives. But they're much, uh, what is important, they're much less happy than Macron and uh, Fillon's voters. And the least happy people are Le Pen. But what is important here that both of these uh, populist voters are unhappy, they are left behind. However, the, uh, the picture is completely different once you look at, uh, at uh, trust to other people. Milan Schoen voters trust other people, even more than Macron voters, so and more than center right voters. Le Pen people distrust people. So here I I'm telling you a story: the difference between extreme left populists and extreme right populists. Extreme left populists are also left behind, are also unhappy. They are also uh, against the elites, but they trust other people. Le Pen voters are the same, but they distrust people, and this is the dimension that we need to take into account. So it's not just distrust in the elites. Both of those distrust the elites, but left-wing populists distrust other people. And this is the second, the two-dimensional diagram, life satisfaction and interpersonal trust. And here I am showing you also not just Le Pen voters who are unhappy and distrust other people, but also people who didn't vote, right? People who abstained or voted blank or null. In France, you can vote uh, blank or you can vote, vote null. So this is kind of these uh, 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 disenchanted voters or protest voters. And you see that Le Pen voters are even more unhappy with the life than disenchanted voters and with trust in other people, trust is even lower. And so here you see how 
Melanchon voters are below average on life satisfaction, but above average on trust. And in that sense, and here you also have Hamon. Hamon is, uh, Hamon is a left center, center left candidate, which was a, a socialist party. It still exists, but Hamon Nabral, Amon, uh, Amon uh, did so badly in the election that in most other pictures, you, you, don't, you don't have Amon, okay? So, um, let me stop here and take your questions uh, before we move on. Okay, thanks. Uh, usually I try to go in the sort of temporal order of the questions, but there's one uh, from Mihail Galashin that is directly related to what you just showed. Is Melanchon anti-EU himself? Is it just voters sorting the politicians with similar views or something deeper? So Melanchon is not, is not anti-EU, so Marine Le Pen uh, in some elections actually supported exit from the EU, or at least from Europe. And uh, she believes that European Commission wants to impose uh, open doors policy on Europe, and she's against that. Milanchon, uh, as all extreme left politicians believe that EU has gone too far in promoting free markets, right? So uh, you know that IFD in Germany believes that EU and European Commission is a socialist behemoth. And think about the European Union being uh, a reincarnation of Soviet Union. Uh, Melanchon criticizes EU from the other side, but it's not, uh, Melanchon is not against EU. And uh, most of his voters actually support uh, uh, fighting climate change. These are kind of young, generally educated voters who are not against EU and Melanchon himself is not against. And so one striking thing is Melanchon has done extremely well. Being an old person, he's done extremely well attracting very young people. It's, it's, it's quite striking. Actually, it sounds very much like uh, Corbyn in the UK. Exactly. Also the, exactly. His, his views on the EU as a sort of tool of capitalists. Uh, yeah. let, me, let me tell you, people don't know what Melanchon's uh, tax proposals are. Yeah, French Sanders. No, Sanders is just an outright capitalist compared to Melanchon. So, uh, Melanchon's tax policy proposal is that marginal income tax rate should be 100% after several hundred uh, thousand euros per year. So if you uh, earn uh, more than several hundred uh, thousand euros per year, you have to pay income tax 100% uh, marginal. And of course, in France, you also have uh, wealth, uh, real estate taxes and so on, so on and so forth. So uh, I wouldn't recommend any rich person to live in France if Melanchon is not involved. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, I'll combine two. There's one from, one from Jakob uh, Ennenhofer about the why this goes back to where we were before, why the regional unemployment is a stronger predictor of populist voting than individual unemployment. And there's a, a related question from uh, Maria Marino. Is, the, is there any work on perceptions of fairness broadly speaking, and populism. I think these two, two go together. I mean, if you perceive that the system is not fair, not fair, it's somehow unfair, the people, your next door neighbors are unemployed, then I guess you are more likely to, uh, to vote populists. Yeah, I fully, uh, I fully agree. So in, in uh, our study of Europe after the crisis, uh, when we look at the various attitudes in our paper, um, so I show, I mentioned here trust towards Europe, national political politicians, so on. Yes, fairness is, as far as I remember, when you look at whether you believe that system is fair or not, perception of fairness really contributes uh, to uh, populist vote. That's, that's for sure. Regarding regional versus individual unemployment, we understand the mechanism as follows. So if you lose your job, you're unhappy, you vote for populist. But even if you don't lose your job, but you have increase in regional unemployment, then you still vote for populists. Why? Because you believe that, well, you think that the system is unfair and other people lose their jobs. And also because it also affects you. There is a debate in the literature. So there is a paper by Yoram Margolit to which we refer, which actually cites these results as a proof that people are not egotistic, that people care about other people. And I'm not sure about that. I, I accept that as a possible explanation, but I also would say that if people around me lose jobs, it affects my own wage as well. 
because my bargaining power vis-a-vis -vis my employer is lower. If uh, unemployment is higher around me, my wage is unlikely to go up. So this is something that may also work, uh, maybe at work. So. Uh, okay, then perhaps switching gears a bit from uh, Toma Kulieva on uh, if we try to anticipate or look, look in the future, do you think that there are some sort of green trends on climate change or sustainable development goals, something like that, that could sort of shift the emphasis of the of the debate away from left right and then perhaps decrease the level of populism is there any indication of in the of uh, of that in the data so we don't we don't see that in the data because uh, the green trend is actually very very recent i one thing which we argue is there are no green populists so first and foremost, green, green narrative is very complex. You really need to trust experts and experts by definition are elites. And in that sense, uh, in that sense, greens and populists are different. Uh, we can only speculate that uh, the rise of green agenda will actually help to uh, reduce the rise of populism. Why? Because you have an existential project. You have an existential threat. And so there is something that elites together with greens and greens are becoming more and more popular. Elites can actually, can actually use this existential threat as a nation building project. So one of the problems of the West, this is something that I mentioned last time, and this is what we discuss in our work on the rise of new generation of autocrats is that in 1990, the West lost an enemy, an existential enemy. And with all tragedies related to terrorism, terrorists are not going to destroy the West. You may say that uh, climate change can, because climate change may result in huge economic uh, costs, uh, but also uh, result in the need to relocate lots of cities. But finally, it may result in uh, huge population migration movements. And I mentioned that million refugees came to Europe in 2015 and 16, but if uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is really hit by climate change, we may see tens of millions of refugees, climate refugees, and that would be an existential challenge. So in that sense, uh, this project may actually unify the voters. And uh, of course, since green agenda requires trust in experts, elites, policymakers, and we know that populists cannot actually deliver on uh, something that requires uh, scientific advice and try to increase distrust in, in experts. I am I, I, hopeful about green agenda, but I should say that we don't have evidence on this because it's recent. Okay, thank you. Well, perhaps the, the last question of this this break on from Tatiana. Uh, this cons concerns the, I mean, we know that corruption can be exported, but the other similar effects uh, with export of populism from one country to another. I mean, I know for a fact that, of course, various populists inside the EU do at least share information and, and so on. But uh, how do you see this in the data? So we don't. Uh, so one of the things that you can observe is that uh, successful uh, democratizations come in waves, and if your neighbor democratizes, you're more likely to democratize which kind of suggests that autocratizations also go in the same direction, right? As for populists, we still don't have too many populists in power. So it's harder to see whether there are spillovers of populist victories. But as you, as you rightly said, Kaczynski talks to Orban and learns from Orban. That is for sure. That is for sure. And they learn from each other. But to what extent uh, there is, so populist voters in France, learn from populist uh, victories in, in the UK. I don't know about research uh, showing it in a rigorous way, but of course the narratives really uh, work this way. So Marine Le Pen says, look, Brexit has happened. So we can also exit Europe uh, or Europe. And she would say Brexit has happened and economically UK is doing well, okay? And so she does use that, and that does, I, have, I, I, I think, brings her more votes, because otherwise she wouldn't have said that. 
She's a very shrewd politician and her narratives are very rational and pragmatic. So they use those arguments, but I don't know uh, any rigorous research that could identify the spillover effects. So, yeah. Okay, thanks, but perhaps we can now move forward. Yeah, let's move on. So uh, Ika in, in, in the chat said that yes, Melanchon voters are educated, but earn less. And that's exactly true. So, okay. I didn't show that on the slide, but it's actually it's actually uh, true uh, in the book and in the working paper. So let me now talk about immigration. So I mentioned that immigration is on the rise. It's actually huge, but unlike what people think, uh, there is no overwhelming evidence that immigration is good for populists. And the reason for that is exactly what I mentioned before. Immigrants move to places where immigrants are welcome. And it's actually very hard to, to see the correlation that immigration brings increase in populist vote in uh, cross-sectional data. And that's why uh, scholars look at uh, identification strategies that help to control for this endogeneity and use uh, two identification strategies. One is random or quasi-random allocation of immigrants or refugees. So, uh, the government says, I impose uh, 100 refugees on these municipalities and uh, 10 refugees on that municipality in whatever way the government does it. If you can convince the referees, the audience, that this allocation was random or quasi-random, that's a valid identification strategy. And then you see if you have more exposure to refugees, you vote for or against populists. And then another instrument is using pre-existing migrant networks. So think about this. There are many Poles in the UK uh, who came to Poland during World War II and right after. And then suddenly in 2004, UK labor market is open for new member states uh, workers. They come, Polish plumbers come to the UK. And of course, there is a obvious fact that they choose places where Polish population already existed. And so you can predict where Polish plumbers would come to, and then, then you use this as an instrument to identify the causal effect. And basically, the takeaway from those studies is that some papers show a causal effect from immigration to higher populist vote, and some papers show, uh, uh, some papers show the uh, negative impact of immigration to populist voting. This is fascinating, but I can show uh, in our paper, we show a number of studies which have one sign of the effect in other studies, another sign of the effect. Actually one uh, famous paper, which uh, looked at uh, previous century in Denmark, where allocation of refugees was uh, uh, random. Uh, this paper, which just recently came out in a, in a top journal shows that, um, that effect on average, is good for populists. So immigration increases populist vote. But if you look at heterogeneity in large cities, it's actually going in the opposite direction, uh, while in small municipalities, it's going in, in the expected direction. Why can uh, you get a causal effect from immigration to lower populist vote? Well, there is a famous book by Gordon Alpert, which talks about contact hypothesis. And it says that uh, the attitude to another group may be empathic, may be positive. If the interaction is uh, reasonably equal, if it's structured in a predicted way, if there is mutual respect, cooperation, and so on. And so if immigrants are well integrated and well taken care of by the government, you should actually expect positive impact. And that is what you find in some studies. So. Uh, and then here, here is a set of, set of uh, studies that uh, looks at pre-2015, pre-2016 studies, and it shows mostly impact of immigration being good for populists. And some of these uh, numbers are pretty large. And so there is Austria, there is France, there is Italy, there is US, where uh, Anna Maria Ma uh, Maida and her co-authors argue that Republicans win from immigration if immigration is low skilled. And again, it's uh, up to you to choose whether uh, 
Republicans are populists here or Democrats, but uh, this is what the study shows. So uh, the recent evidence is actually more complex. So there is a paper by uh, uh, and, uh, and Andres uh, 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 Steinmeier on Austria, which looks at 2015 elections in which FPO, the populist party, the right-wing party did quite well. So this paper just came out in review of economics and statistics. So he shows that more immigrants actually is bad for populists and the impact is quite large. Uh, the important point here is that share of refugees and population on average in municipality was about one and a half refugees per hundred natives. Now, when he looks at not settled refugees, but transit routes, he shows that transit migration actually increases the share of populace. And this is kind of in line with all part hypothesis. Settlement increases empathy because you interact with the refugees. Transit is where you don't interact, you only see more garbage, more disorder, and so you dislike refugees and you vote for anti-immigrant politicians. Same is in uh, France, where you actually find positive effect. And this is a resettlement of what's called Calais jungle. France had this huge informal refugees camp near Calais, near the Eurostar tunnel. These are where the people who tried to sneak into the UK, where the jobs were. In France, there were no jobs for refugees. And so at some point, French government just took the jungle and relocated it throughout the country, putting people into uh, free uh, tourist uh, camps, basically. And since tourist camps are located throughout the country, are not correlated with uh, um, political, prior, um, pr political preferences, Verti and Viscanich argue that it's quasi random. So they show that for average municipality, the influx of refugees was actually bad news for Marine Le Pen vote. And so this is again empathy and so on. But what I like about this study, except for that it was written by uh, two of my students, what I like about this study is that there is a nonlinear effect. Once the share of refugee exceeds certain threshold, three or four percent of refugees per one native, further increase in share of refugees increases Marine Le Pen vote share. So the relationship is nonlinear. If few refugees, natives vote against Marine Le Pen. More refugees after a certain threshold increase in share of refugees results in higher populist vote. Okay, so a similar paper is on Greek islands. It's published, uh, there are actually a few papers published, published on, on this. And it shows that uh, well, this Greek islands in 2015, it's not uh, two and a half refugees per hundred natives. It's two and a half refugees per native, per one native. So it was a huge influx. So we shouldn't be uh, surprised that was very strong positive impact of voting for a Nazi party. This party is now officially recognized as, as a Nazi party. Now, similar thing you find in, uh, in uh, uh, you keep vote uh, by Becker and Fetzer where once you identify the causal effect, you see a strong, strong result. Uh, the previous study by Becker and co-authors, which found no result was a cross-sectional result. I mentioned that you really need to look at uh, identification strategy. That was actually another paper by, another, by, by Max Viskanich, whom I already mentioned, who looked at Polish immigrants into the UK. Once you instrument Polish immigrants by pre-existing Polish population, you also see that Polish immigrants result in higher vote for refugees. So uh, let me skip the immigration story because there is no strong evidence, probably because we don't have enough data. But in general, the takeaways from this research is evidence is mixed. You can find a positive and negative effects and probably the way you should think about it, skill composition matters, magnitude matters, and quality of integration also matters. So it's not that obvious that populism always results in higher vote for immigration. So let me quickly talk about uh, the new technology. We talked about that a lot. So uh, I would just say that we are living in a very interesting decade where internet is on the rise. It's not just broadband internet, it's also mobile broadband. So here I show you number of mobile, active mobile broadband uh, um, uh, subscriptions in the world since 2007. And, uh, and uh, 
you see there was zero mobile broadband in 2007. Actually, 4% of global population had access to mobile broadband. Now it's more like 70%. And uh, this is a much faster growth than fixed broadband. Fixed broadband has also increased, but it's still below 20%. So overall, the global increase in broadband is increase in mobile broadband. And it's all actually what allows for social media to rise. And in our paper with Nikita Melnikov and Nikaterina Zhuravska, we show that this growth is correlated with the growth of social media. Again, in 2005, there was no Facebook. Today we have two and a half million, billion people on Facebook. So, um, the, interestingly, initially, more broadband internet did not contribute to the rise of populism. So the first paper on the impact of uh, internet on uh, politics when internet was still fixed broadband internet and there were no social media shows that uh, increase of broadband access resulted in decline in political participation. So what they do, Compounded Durant and Sobre, this paper published in Journal of European Economic Association, it looks at Italian municipalities, it predicts the arrival of fixed broadband by the pre-existing uh, voice technology. So they have a um, uh, identification strategy, which is uh, quite convincing. So this paper shows that arrival of internet in the first decade of 21st century had no effect on the populace. But it reduced turnover, turnout, sorry. It reduced participation in the voting, probably because fixed broadband internet crowds out political content with entertainment content. However, starting in the second decade and as early as 2009, access to broadband, uh, probably because of social media, but this is where it starts, increases turnout back and increases the vote for populist, in particular, uh, five-star movement. Five-star movement is a movement which emerged completely online. It would be impossible to imagine its rise without online. And they show that it grows since 2009, really uh, in the places where people had access to the internet. However, uh, there is also another study which uh, is coming out in uh, QGE, in in uh, the fall of 2021. This is a paper with Nikita Melnikov and Katya Zhuravska. So what we do, we don't just look at one country, we look at the whole world. And we show that the rise of mobile broadband internet of the whole world reduces confidence in government. However, what I'm showing uh, to you now is the uh, voting in Europe. So we look at 2007, 2018 elections in 33 European countries. Uh, because these are democracies where it's easier to find comparable vote data and there, there is less uh, uh, concern about vote fraud and so on. So we look at Europe and basically we take 33 countries. For them, we have easy classification into populist, non populist And we look at uh, about three elections per country and we look at about 400 subnational regions. So our observations are election region pairs and we have about a thousand observations. So basically all European elections in the last, the last 10 years. And basically the result is uh, the, uh, the mobile broadband, first and foremost, mobile broadband was not existing in Europe. Only 38% of Europeans had access to mobile broadband in 2007. By 2018, 90% uh, of Europeans had access to mobile broadband. And uh, we, of course, weighed by population density. So it's not just that uh, you have no mobile broadband in some parts of Scandinavia, just nobody lives here, right? But you see in Finland, you have access to mobile broadband everywhere, just everywhere. And uh, Spain still has some missing places, uh, Scotland, but again, nobody lives here. So that was a huge increase in mobile broadband from, as I said, 40 to 90% of the people in Europe. And it had a major decline in incumbent parties vote share. So here we show how the change in coverage by 3G, third generation mobile network. So the uh, 3G and 4G actually, uh, the mobile broadband. Uh, so places where you have an increase from zero to 100. So these are the places where increase was from 0% to 100%. These places had a popular uh, incumbent vote share by 
about 9% less than places where you had no change in mobile broadband. And as I said, on average, the increase was 50%. So on average, incumbent party vote share declined by about four and a half, four percentage points, just because of the mobile uh, internet. Now, in the rest of the paper, where we look at confidence in the government, we use an identification strategy based on lightnings and so on, which is used in this literature. But here is just a panel regression with, uh, uh, with uh, region fixed effects. So we don't have an instrument in this regression. But uh, we believe, and at least we've convinced very, very careful referees that this effect should be treated seriously. And then who benefits when incumbents lose? Well, non-populist opposition doesn't. Green parties also don't. There is no change. If mobile internet goes up, green parties vote share doesn't change. Who benefits are right-wing populists and left-wing populists. The effect is especially strong on right-wing populists. It's about nine percentage points here. So if you move from zero to 100 coverage, 100% 100 coverage. So if you move from 40% coverage to 90% coverage, the change is about five percentage points, okay? And for left-wing populists, the effect is smaller. It's about six, seven percentage points. So here, the average move from 40% coverage to 90% coverage would move you by about three, three and a half percentage points. So together, the rise of populism in Europe uh, can be explained by about half uh, by the rise in mobile broadband, if you believe in this data. So why social media help populists? We discussed that, and uh, I would just say, I would just say that uh, um, there are different stories, and I mentioned that uh, social media contribute to contribute to polarization and to dissemination of false narratives. But in this paper, we can't show that, and this is actually quite unfortunate that uh, we don't have good data on this. But uh, we can speculate, and the speculation is exactly what I talked about last time. Now, let me actually wrap up. So we have ten, uh, time for questions in the end of the lecture. But let me just say that in the slides that I pose on, uh, on uh, the uh, website, when, uh, when the video is, when the recording is, is, uh, is uh, placed on the website, I'll also post the slides. I refer to several papers. Uh, where we look at the uh, performance of populists uh, when they come to power. Basically, there are some descriptive um, studies. There are also studies based on uh, synthetic growth uh, um, method, uh, synthetic uh, uh, growth control method, where you compare GDP performance to uh, counterfactual, which is based on a weighted average of similar economies. And that's done for Trump, that's done for Brexit, that's done for the global sample of populists. Uh, that is the paper by Funke, Shularek, and Trebesh. Uh, and these papers show very quickly what, uh, that populists underperform badly. Now, Trump has not underperformed before 2020. He's not underperformed. He's not outperformed either. Brexit out underperformed a lot. So after Brexit, UK economy was losing one percentage point a year every year in terms of GDP. In addition to GDP, they don't do better in terms of inequality. They actually do worse in terms of quality of institutions, being uh, media freedom and rule of law. And then one thing which is not on the slides, but which is in the survey is when Trump comes to power, hate crime goes up. When populists in Germany become more successful, uh, hate crime goes up. So this is, this is very, very important. And some of the studies are very well done. Some of them are actually randomized. And so you find, you find uh, substantial, substantial effects. So this is the picture from Funke, Scholar, and Trebesh. This is this uh, data set on uh, 50 populist governments since 1900 until 2018. And what they show here is the counterfact uh, populist versus counterfactual. And they show that both right-wing and left-wing populists underperform the counterfactual. So you see the counterfactual before populists come to power is the same as the performance of the country. And then when populists come to power, the gap relative to counterfactual is increasing. 
and is reaching by minus, reaching minus 10% after 15 years. So if you populist comes to power today, the history tells us that in 15 years, GDP will be 10 percentage points lower. That's a lot. There are some exceptions. And the one exception I would mention is Poland. Poland has done well uh, under the recent peace government. I can speculate and explain why. But on average, as I said, the evidence from these 50 countries shows that populists are not doing well in terms of GDP. So let me conclude here. So we have, uh, I skipped a lot of slides on, on uh, populism and power, but let me, uh, let me just say that uh, this survey gives you a workable operational definition and referees were extremely happy about that. And they pushed us in this direction that we can uh, have a consensus definition, uh, which helps economics and political economy field more generally. And this definition is the lowest common denominator, which is anti-elite and anti-pluralism. And whatever classification you use based on this definition, you end up with the result that we have unprecedented rise of populism. And in particular in Europe, in the last 20 years, the vote share of populists increased by 10, 15 percentage points, which means it doubled. Now, what are the drivers? We have strong evidence on uh, economic factors, both long-term and one-off crisis and subsequent, subsequent, uh, subsequent austerity. We have strong evidence on the role of internet. We have descriptive evidence, uh, but I would say very interesting and, and quite convincing, but descriptive evidence on culture. And some papers show the role of immigration, especially when immigration is large and, uh, and not well handled. And I didn't mention my own paper on trans exposure to transit migration, but uh, we, we have a paper which shows that transit migration is especially painful, painful for attitudes to the elites. And um, there may be the case that politics uh, of uh, populism is driven not just by cultural factors, but their interaction between culture and economics. But uh, as I mentioned, there is a paper where cultural problems were just produced by populists out of thin air. And then finally, populism in, part, in power underperform. And it's not just GDP, but other things. So what should be done? As I mentioned last time, solutions are pretty much missing in the sense that there is no research yet because all of that is recent. And then you can speculate by looking at the causes, you can speculate what solutions uh, should be. And solutions should be don't leave people behind, uh, regulate, internet, fight uh, propagation of false news on internet, create uh, communications, fight polarization and echo chambers, um, create joint projects, and uh, uh, also involve citizens. So I'm a big fan of deliberative or deliberative democracies where you create citizens assembly or social conventions where you randomly pick normal people and ask them to think about a specific issue and discuss it. So for several weekends, talk to experts, talk to politicians, but most importantly, talk to each other and decide what you need to do, for example, to fight climate change in a, in a fair way. And I think this is, this is the right approach. And after the citizen assemblies produce recommendations, it's very hard for elites to reject those. And it's very hard for the voters to reject those because these come from normal people. And so finally, I would say that we need to do something with political selections because part of the rejections of the elites is because elites are closed. In order to become a polit politician today, you need to go through elite schools and uh, your whole career is dedicated to politics. To, to become a successful politician, you can't be a normal person. And that, of course, is used by populists. So you need to create more entries into political careers. And so I don't know how to do that, but this is something that we need to think about. Unfortunately, we don't have much evidence on that exactly because the rise of populism is recent. And I think this should be an exciting research agenda for the times uh, to come. So let me stop here and take questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Sergey. I... I will have a few questions from the chat. Uh, first of all, from uh, from Luigi uh, Bogian. Uh, this is on the perception of 
economic inequality does it affect the support for right and left wing populists differently and this is interesting because you showed us just previously how the spread of broadband access seems to affect the support for both kind of populists equally what the, what, what about the other factors so um so in general in general people uh, this is the interesting interesting part of uh, a new right wing uh, uh, right wing uh, narrative so they use inequality for their narrative and then they just say that the tools to resolve the inequality issues are different left wing people support redistribution right wing populists support nationalism so this is different and this is exactly because of this trust gap marine le pen says inequality is a problem okay her voters believe inequality is a problem but we will not ask for redistribution why because we can cannot trust other people who can redistribute okay and so instead we close our borders and we reduce immigration and we reduce trade so this is the gap so they identify the same problem but they propose different solutions uh, okay then we go to uh, Mikael Castaneda on the spread of the internet and then the what what effect that, that that has so he proposes that there are two two options on the effect the one is information story that is citizens use internet to learn on the on the quality of their government and then they to sort of implicitly distance the frontier analysis and perhaps learn that the government is not very good and then the second option is that the populism spreads like a virus and it doesn't matter how good or bad your government is that somebody is infected uh, can you this or is it possible to disentangle these two effects so the answer is uh, we do have convincing evidence on option one we have suggestive evidence on option two so on option one do people actually learn through information about government corruption the answer is yes we show in that grief mainly kabzorovsky paper that when you use measures of actual corruption, and this exists, we use two measures. One is so-called Global Incidence of Corruptions Index built by IMF. Please read my paper. Uh, uh, this, this is a great data set, which somehow is not used by anybody but this particular paper. <laughs> um, uh, so it's a recently built measure of corruption in incidents. It's a panel, annual panel for the whole world. Mm -hmm. And so we show that more corrupt countries um, in more corrupt countries, govern, uh, uh, sorry, if you have a more corrupt government and you have mobile broadband internet, people have higher perception that government is corrupt. If you don't have mobile broadband internet, uh, there is no correlation between actual corruption and perceived corruption. So it is true that people learn about actual corruption using mobile broadband internet. Now, moreover, if you look at the least corrupt countries, uh, such as the top uh, cleanest 13 countries, which I think includes both Belgium and Finland, it also includes Switzerland, New Zealand, does not include uh, US, very important. Once you start including the US, the result goes away. But if you only look at a subsample of 13 cleanest countries, the correlation is different. When internet arrives, confidence in government improves, probably because internet tells you how corrupt other countries are, or maybe you learn how corrupt your country is. So the, the mechanism you just mentioned is exactly what we find in the data, and we can be quite uh, confident that this mechanism works. Now, the other mechanism is that indeed uh, internet and social media spread false narratives, and I think our results on populist vote are explained by this. We also produce a number of case studies. And one of the case studies, as I said, is Bolsonaro. And I, as I said, Bolsonaro really benefited from WhatsApp. WhatsApp was used by 90% of uh, uh, Brazilian internet users. Also, most of them actually used what's called zero rating plans, where you can only have access to social media, but not to independent websites. So for those people, fact checking was impossible. And so he used it. He had no access to TV because he was an outsider. And he ran a campaign on digital. And part of his narrative was 
legitimate because elites were corrupt, but part of his narrative were actually based on fake news. And so we don't have strong evidence on this, but it's probably, it's probably true. So. Uh, okay, perhaps one more que uh, question before we wrap up uh, from uh, Maria Marcela, how are, are you there? So in, in Latin America, once in government, the, the concern of the followers uh, of the, for the corruption of the political leaders seems to decrease. And then they, there's a sort of ideological defense of the leadership that becomes stronger. Uh, is that well, this visible, Adoka? Uh, so this is not something that uh, we know because, um, uh, well, you, you, uh, all, all this, and this is why we focus on Europe because in all Latin American countries, you have kind of hybrid regime uh, uh, transformation. So Chavez was not really a Democrat. So vote uh, shares for Chavez already are problematic. Correa, same thing. Bolsonaro probably will run an honest election. So we'll see. But overall, uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Um, so it's it's not it's it's much harder to judge what's happening in Latin America than in Europe. But it is true that uh, Bolsonaro used uh, corruption of the incumbents very skillfully. But that was a huge scandal. That was a huge scandal in Petrobras, right? What's called Operation Car Wash, where basically Bolsonaro had no opponent because. The incumbent party has Dilma Rousseff, she's indicted. Her vice president is also investigated. So he's highly unpopular, so he decides not to run. So they bet on, uh, on uh, Lula da Silva, but Lula is also indicted and is not allowed to run. And uh, then they put Haddad, who is an honest guy, but he is uh, a, a level below those former presidents. And then the other party, uh, the Social Democratic Party also has no uh, no chance uh, no chance uh, to win because it was involved in the Operation Car Wash corruption scandal. So, so corruption matters in Latin America. Whether uh, whether Bolsonaro is clean, the answer is no. His family is not clean, and he actually fired uh, his uh, justice minister, I think, or prosecutor who was very operational in investigating Operation Car Wash, but then he started to investigate Bolsonaro's sons. So there is, there is a, a problem in Bolsonaro's, Bolsonaro's government as well. So I can't really say much. Now, one, one thing I wanted to mention, uh, 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 Mikhail Castanera put uh, numbers on Poland in, in the chat. So all European, all East European countries gain 3% of GDP in social cohesion funds. Uh, and in Hungary, that fully explains economic growth in Hungary. So Hungarian growth was 3% over the last uh, 10 years in, uh, in the times of Fidesz in power, Viktor Orban's in power since 2010. And uh, contribution from EU budget was 3%. So it's, uh, even with that, uh, Hungary underperformed counterfactual. But pretty much uh, Orban without Europe would have done much worse. And also one of the things that I would like to mention that we definitely know that Orban has built a corrupt machine. So this is control of corruption in Central and Eastern European countries. And you see that Hungary in 2010 was a middle of the pack. Today, it has zero control of corruption score. So Hungary being a high income country is as corrupt as the average country in the world, which is quite a, quite a disaster. So I would say that. It's five o'clock, perhaps time to, to stop and wrap, wrap up. I would like to thank, of course, Sergei for this, this wonderful two, two lectures. I learned a lot and I'm sure, sure, sure that many we all, of, all of us did. I'd like to thank all the participants for a very lively discussion. We unfortunately had to forego a great number of, of good questions in the interest of time. That, uh, other things coming coming up, uh, so we need to leave. Uh, as was mentioned in the beginning, the recording of the lectures and the slides will be made available at the CEPR website, I, I guess sometime next week. 
and uh, then I don't know how these both, CPR uh, both, will... Yeah, both Ika and myself are on Twitter and we'll put ref, uh, links uh, to that website uh, on Twitter. Definitely, definitely, yes. Okay, then thank you very much. Uh, have a nice Thursday evening and uh, hope the weekend will be nice and uh, uh, corona-free wherever you are. Thanks.